this is what I'm trying to tell you, man. I'm just trying to tell you. This is why Christians believe that the that the words of Paul supersede things that Christ said. Oh, no, no, get, don't wow. get, don't get, that uh, is incredible. Wait, Y'all wait. Christians believe that in here? Wait, 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 okay, so get up. There's a way to clear these get up. Get there's a way to clear these up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. In the gospel, not what you just said, get up. This ain't going to tell him to out. Oh, him. Christ ain't going to tell him to change his words. That's crazy, get up. Get up. Can you just read, can you just read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 for us, please? Thank you. Please read. That. Okay, read it, bro. Yeah, you're better than that, bro. I've heard you speak better. No, seriously, you can't say something like that, bro. Okay, wait. Brother, what the hell did I just hear? I have no clue, my brother, but I definitely want to um just uh have this follow-up room for people just to continue the dialogue because I already knew that Grant was gonna shut it down. So um yeah i'm gonna I'm leave it here y'all can come to the stage and continue the dialogue man. hey salaki man please bring my brother Corey up Corey, you ain't gonna believe what this man ghetto just said bro this man started off by saying the paulian letters supersede the gospels and then this man got puffed up and had the nerve to say paul's writings supersede the words of christ words of christ that was crazy Oh my lord. And the replays was on too, so I'm definitely gonna clip that. Hey, I already <laughs> got the clips. <laughs> yeah, all man. the Christians were silent when he said that. And, and the only person that came to his aid was LeGrant because he knew he had to do some damage control. That was bad, man. Wow. I've never heard a Christian say that before in my life, man. That was the first Hold time on, I heard so, it. So Lucky on um, Shalom to the panel. So so you're saying that LeGrant made the statement? No, 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 no. 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 Ghetto, Ghetto president. president did. LeGrant tried to save him oh, because none of the Christians Ghetto. were saying anything after he spoke. Oh wow, Ghetto. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was, I was trying to get an understanding of him. By the way, Shalom, Shalom. I was trying to get an understanding. I, I didn't know if, if that's what he actually meant. I'm trying to figure out like what's going on. I hope that's and, not and what he meant. Yeah, and you know, you have brought that out, Jay, when you said earlier um, about him keep going into the Pauline epistles and you read uh, Romans 15 and 4, right? Um, and we know the things that um, Yeshua said predated anything that Paul came along to say. So it's, just, it's interesting to me that I guess to captivate the attention of the panel, because I guess he didn't win the favor of everybody, was to make some kind of shocking statement and then he... He begrudgingly wanted people to challenge him. I gave him one scripture that shows that nothing that Paul says or did has any kind of preeminence over the words of Christ because he has to imitate. The one who's the imitate is not greater than the one who he is imitating. So how could anything he say be greater? If anything, it has to coincide and harmonize what's being said by the one who he's imitating. So to hear that, it was just shocking, you know, and again, I wanted to continue to hear him kind of fix that or, you know, kind of explain what he meant. But, you know, the grant is like, it's time for bed at this point because he doesn't <laughs> <no safe> <laughs> yeah, got sleeping. Yeah, man. I'm about to ping him in here. I yeah, ping, him ping him. everybody in here, man. And let's, let's talk about this, man. Get ghetto because I know ghetto want to keep on. So if somebody can get ghetto in here. I'll even give him a green B. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm not no hater like that. I want to hear what he has to say, honestly. Um, all right. Yeah. So if anybody else wanted, anybody else who was in that room, if you have something you want to say, Tyree, um, I don't know if you have your hand up. Oh, yeah, you do. Okay. I'll bring you to the stage. All right. Go ahead, King. Hey, yeah. I just wanted to say, uh, I mean, I think that that was something that, uh, I mean, I think the first, my first take, on it with you guys saying it i mean i wasn't a witness to it but if you know if he clearly said it i would say the first thing is that he's honest because that's something that we kind of know like you guys feel that the pauline epistles trump christ they just would never say it so most so-called christians would never say that but teach and instruct in that manner 
So everything you go to establish that what Christ said, they're going to go to Paul and say that, no, look what Paul said. They're going to do it. So it's something that I was, you know, like kind of understanding already. And I think the first step is to realize that's what you're doing. You know what I mean? Like that's the, the first step is to just to get away from the denial phase. So it's like, exactly. so you teach out of the Paul's letters and Paul trumps Christ to you. Now that's you it. have to, now you have to take a day to sleep on that. You, you now have to embrace what you said. And then you will have to say, well, why do I feel like Paul's letters or words trump Christ's letters if I consider myself to be a Christian versus a Paulinian? So should I follow Christ more than I follow Paul? You know, what is what is this order? Paul said he follows Christ and Christ never said he follows Paul. He actually comes in a vision and you know, makes Paul drop down for going against him. So Paul, I mean, Christ even put Paul in his place in a vision. Matter of fact, he had that thorn in his side, right? So he was humbled, you know what I'm saying? So there's no way that anything that he says trumps or supersede. When you say supersede, that means to go above something. How? How? He has no ministry without Christ. How, how is that possible? You know, so so like you said, at least he was being honest, and I give that to him. He was being honest, and he said what a lot of people was thinking, but they didn't they didn't want to be held to that, right? And and again, the simple fact that there was utter silence from all the Christians who were vocative when that was pronounced to me is just wow. They 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 knew it. Like man, why did he say it? I was trying to keep it to myself. Why did he actually say it? He said it. So yeah, yeah the replays is on, man. Like you said, when when you go back. If you ever go back, it wasn't even a short, uh, long room anyway, because it was a continuation of a previous room. But yeah, the replays is on, and I'm definitely going to clip that. Yeah. Yeah, he talked. I told him to come in his room. He's talking about some coming mind, man. <laughs> He's scared. I'm the kryptonite. <laughs> you know what? It's so funny because he was on that stage and said, if anybody wants to smoke or whatever with me, come on on to my room. But when somebody invites you, you don't want to. you don't want to show up. So... So what's, what, what is it then? I don't understand. I don't have a problem going into the lines then. Like, you know why? Because I'm going to be Daniel. And those mouths are going to get silenced. That's how it's going to work. Y'all going to be with me. So it doesn't matter where I go. If y'all's with you, it doesn't matter whose room you get invited to show up. Matter of fact, LeGrant is the one that invited me to his rooms and invited me on stage to speak. I didn't actually do any of that. I just wanted to listen in the audience. But as soon as I spoke, as soon as I started speaking, cut me off, interrupting, it's just, it's sad, man. It's sad. But I think ghetto for t speaking was on the mind of a lot of people and just being real with it. So I, he gets all my respect for that. I just need him to defend the rest of that. So matter of fact, just tell him, if you want me to come to his Voltron room, I'll debate him on that. Let's see if Paul's words supersede the Gospels. I'll definitely debate him on that. Yeah, I told I told him if he come into this room, you know, uh, you know, per your words, he'll get a green bean. Just you yep. and him. Uh, no, no, no. It won't just be me and him, but he'll have an opportunity to speak, so he don't think that I'm biased. Because I know in his rooms, he never gives me a green bean. But I want to have him an opportunity to speak and also receive questions. And I don't want him to think that I'm silencing him or kicking him down the audience. I want him to show that hey, you got the floor. Yeah, he texts me, he says, or he can challenge me in a debate on my platform. <laughs> but he can't have a preliminary discussion <laughs> here. Why can't he have the preliminary discussion here first then? Right, okay, okay, yeah, I think that'll be fair. Let me, let me hit him back. Let me hit him back. No let problem. I'm over here trying to listen to the clip just so I make sure I ain't hear it wrong. <laughs> but hey, man, that brother Devon Prospect tried to save him the first time when when he started to uh, to uh, put his foot in his mouth. When the first claim he made was that the Pauline letters were over authoritative over the um the Gospels, and uh, brother Devon was like, "Wait, wait, wait, hold up, what?" 
And that brother had to double down, and that, man, it turned to a slippery slope, man. And that brother ended up saying, uh, Paul's words supersede the words of Christ. That was that was incredible, man. That was incredible. Yeah, um, I don't. Bad Jack. Yeah, man. I don't. I don't. This is just my hope. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't truly think that he was actually meaning to say it like that. But since he's so like prideful and in his own, he already kind of got stuck in it, and it's like, all right, well, I can't go back on it now. And I'm yeah. hoping that's the view viewpoint to which he was addressing it again man we all brothers and sisters you know hopefully that's you know the aim in which he was going with but i mean if not then he may just be stuck i agree and that's why i want to give him an opportunity in here to just uh, and if you want me to shut up i'll shut up and i'll just let him speak so that's the thing i want to be fair and i want to give him an opportunity to speak and explain what he meant because i think jay i think you're absolutely right i think when he said that because afterwards, after he said it, it's like everybody jumped in and then he was like, whoa, whoa, wait, hold on, hold on. And I guess he wanted to clarify it. But then he went and he he did clarify and then he topped it off the exclamation mark by saying that Paul's words trumps Christ's words. And I think he's saying because Christ gave him the authority to preach. So so he came after and he's, the, I guess, the continuation of Christ's words. I don't know. I'm trying to find a way to make it make sense without misrepresenting his position but the only way we'll know is if he has enough gall to come in here and just speak yeah nobody i'll make sure everybody's muted i'll give him a green bean and he can just explain himself but as you can see he's only comfortable when he has control yeah right and 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 when that happens to me i question that because you see i was in the grants room every time i go to the grants room the odds is always against me right everybody jumps on me the sister was accusing me of bad character and doesn't even know me um, the grant's cutting me off, and I'm trying to make a point, always shortening my time. And guess what? Whenever he invites me, I go back, right? Because peradventure, somebody will hear it in the audience because that's who we are speaking to, right? Not to each other. The audience needs the edification, right? They're the ones there to grow. They're sitting there at 3, 4 in the morning listening to these conversations. So it is our job to make them as edifying as possible so they don't feel that their time was wasted, right? So that's why when I try to take time to exegete a passage, break it down, I try to walk with people through it. And as you can see, even with the sister I was talking to, she just didn't want to hear. She said, what's your motivation? Let's get to your point. What's your end goal? I'm like, sis, let's let's walk together, right? And let's, let's, let's do this together because, you know, perhaps if you listen, then you'll understand. That's like when she went to Matthew 5 um and 17 and she says oh what's the all that's to be fulfilled it's the law and then she jumps to john 19 where the law the word law is nowhere in the whole entire chapter and he's saying on the cross it is finished right so that's all be fulfilled and i'm trying to explain to them in the language there's clauses clauses makes up your sentences if you cannot identify clauses you're going to read something away that's like that's like me reading an English sentence that has commas, and I just read it straight through. Me reading an English language uh, a, a sentence that has parentheses, and I'm just reading it straight through. Like you don't treat the English language that way. So if somebody's sharing with you, hey sis, these are like different clauses, and the Greek shows you how to connect what, because the word order in Greek can always vary, but they are key indicators, right? When we see how things are declined for nouns or how things are in, in, inflected for verbs. Um, and the syntax, we can tell what's what. So when they try to rush through it and they say, so the scriptures were filled and they go into I thirst, I'm saying, wait, when, he, when the part says the scriptures were filled, they're only talking about I thirst. That's it. And when it says all that is fulfilled, what is the context? What is being performed at that moment? That is what he's referring to, because obviously if the gospel is the death, burial and resurrection, well, only one of the three occurred at that point. So what is the real context? And that's the problem that's scary is that a lot of them don't want to do the context. And then I tried to give them a non-biased source, what we call exegetical commentaries. So what exegetical commentaries do is that they go into the language and they break down for you what is going on. So you can get a better sense. Now, this is for people who a lot of times who are not really familiar with the language or people who may be, but what it does is that it shows you all of the mechanics that's going on in the language. So you can't say, this is what it's supposed to say. That's what it's supposed to say. No, you, you actually see what the language is saying. 
And if you go into the exegetical commentary, a good one is the one by Zonovan. Their series is really good. On the book of John, they will agree with that and they'll tell you, no, this is not talking about this, all the scriptures. That's not what it's saying. It's, it's, it's different clauses there and they're handled a particular way, right? So I just, I, and again, I guess something's wrong. I mean, apparently I'm high-minded and I even apologize to the sister and the elder. And I said, look, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to walk with y'all through it so that the audience will have an understanding. But apparently, as you can see, it's a fixed fight and it's okay. You know, because always I have somebody hit me up in the back channel um, who's interested in learning more. And I just want to point them to y'all. That's all. Okay. Um, anybody else want to speak? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Whoever that was. Go ahead. Y'all just want to ask you a quick question. So um, I know you said Zondervan has an exegetical commentary. How do you actually uh, gain access to that? Do you, I, I, it I just, I'll send it to you. To just send me your email. I'll send it to you. Okay, I got you. Yeah, I got you. If anybody else wants it, just just shoot me your email. I'll get it to you. Um, because it, and, and here's the thing, right? Um, I'm talking about a non-biased source. What do I mean by that? Well, if I don't identify as a Christian in the orthodoxy, which is used today, right, in that sense, um, I'm sharing a resource where the author identifies as a Christian and they agree with what I'm saying, right? At least on that point, right? They agree with what I'm saying because it's one thing that I'm not gonna argue with, what the, what the language is. Like the language is not gonna lie. How you interpret what's being said is something totally different. But what is being said linguistically is not gonna lie, it's there. You can't change it unless you find like a textual variant in another manuscript or something, but that's another conversation. But for the most part, the text will show you how the clauses are situated and what connects with what, right? And once you see that, now you got to contend with that in your interpretation. And interpretation has to be done before translation, right? So first you have to understand the language. And once you parse through the language, you understand all the mechanics of what's going on, then you reconstruct it, and then you interpret what's being said. Interpretation sometimes can draw on your bias or your presuppositions. Right. And sometimes it can be objective. It can be it's always a, a mixture of both. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, when you look at a translation, this is why they have committees. They have more than one person doing translations. Right. Because one person, they can be affected. Their biases can affect the, the translation. So they try to have committees with people who have different backgrounds in regards to, you know, denominational understandings and doctrines and stuff like that. So that way you can get the consensus from this committee so that you can have a faithful translation. So I say that to say, I offered that in the discussion. I said, hey, you know, if, if, if I can, I would like for you guys to take a look at an exegetical commentary so you can understand what's going on. There's even one from Matthew too that goes into Matthew 17 and 19. And guess what? They agree with what I was saying. Why? Because when you understand the language and the context, it's not difficult to understand. When I brought up Deuteronomy chapter 30, 34, where the book of the law was placed on the side of the covenant as a witness, the sister said, oh, it's condemnation. I said, well, wait, witnesses are not there to condemn. They're there to give a testimony of something that occurred, right? And we see that in any kind of court setting, right? Witnesses can't condemn you. They can only give a testimony. The person that condemns you is the prosecutor. The witnesses can't condemn you, right? They can only give a testimony, right? Speak on something that is true because they're under oath. So what does Moses do? He says that heaven and earth will also be a witness to you until this day. Why do you think that same language shows up in Matthew 5? Why is Jesus saying the same thing about heaven and earth passing away? Because they're going to continue to be the testimony connected to the law. Heaven and earth. So until that's gone, guess what? You're never going to be fully in that new covenant because it is a witness, not just the book and the side of the covenant, but heaven and earth. And when you go into exegetical commentaries, what they do is they look for themes. They identify themes. A great uh, New Testament survey for Christians out there is called The Story Retold by Benjamin L. Glad and G.K. Beale. Excellent, excellent New Testament survey. New Testament survey is a book that pretty much introduces you to the New Testament before you actually get into it, right? 
And one thing that they attempt to do in there, which they've been very successful from what I can see, is give Christians an overview understanding of the quote unquote Old Testament so they can understand the New Testament. It's fascinating what they do. And they talk about different things to look at, typologies, themes, irony, all different types of literary devices. And when you hear that idiom, heaven and earth, that is a Hebraic cultural expression. And the only way that the law can be done away with is if heaven and earth is done away because it is the witness. It's the witness. And none of that's going to be done until Christ comes, rules, and reigns. None of that's going to happen until then. So some kind of modification has happened until the fulfillment of the New Testament occurs, because according to Old Testament prophecies, there's a lot of things that need to be done. The children of Israel needs to be restored back to the land. The land needs to be in peace. A whole lot of things supposed to happen in this new covenant. So the part which is initiated where Christ came, he did the spiritual part so the kingdom could receive by the people. This is why when he first came on the scene in Mark chapter one, because according to New Testament scholars, Mark one was the first gospel. It's called the Markian priority. Right. That's the consensus in New Testament scholarship. Right. So with that being said, if that is the first gospel, the first words he says is repent. For the kingdom is at hand. And I always ask Christians, is Jesus preaching to people who would have been dumb, ignorant, blind and deaf and not know anything that he was saying? And I said and they'll add, they'll say to me, well, let's go to this. Path. I'm like, no, no, no. Right here when he's saying this. Is he saying it to people who are expected to be competent enough to know what he's saying? Because if not, then he's just speaking in vain. But apparently they were. They knew what he was saying, right? But the issue, especially the religious leaders had, is that he didn't, what authority did he have to say this? He didn't go through our schools. He didn't come on our tutelage. Who's giving this man the authority to say so? This is why he keeps referring back to the Father, right? So I'll close out on this and let anybody else who wants to speak. This, this, I don't know what ghetto price. I don't think he's ever going to show up. But the bottom line is, I think that the issue with some Christians, not all, and, and again, this, I'm not bashing Christians, but just some Christians, not all, it's the simple fact that they never want to make the attempt to harmonize what is in the Tanakh or what's in the New Testament. And to be honest with you, the consensus of Christians in New Testament studies, that is the basis of the direction that they're going today. If you don't believe me, then show up at one of these conferences. I go to them every year, every year, and I hear what's on the table. I hear the direction, and this is where they're going. This is why the work, the story we told by Benjamin L. Glad and G.K. Beale got so much critical acclaim and praise because it's ushering the direction where now Christians now have to be more cognizant of the foundation in which the New Testament is founded on. And if you're not, then you'll come out and say things like, well, heaven and earth don't really mean heaven and earth. Wait, 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 wait. Do you know how to identify an idiom? And then how do you know that that idiom is matched to what culture and what language? For example, Paul uses idioms all the time. He even pulls them from classical Greek authors, which is fascinating. But how do we know that? Because of the syntax and morphology, we're able to see that this is not Hebraic and thought. This is coming from a different culture. Because when you understand the style of the culture and how it's written, you know who to marry it towards, right? Especially when he quotes things verbatim. So when we see heaven and earth, the law cannot go anywhere until heaven and earth passes away. It can't because it's the witness, the witness that Moses called into effect as a testimony for the children of Israel. And that's why I said to them, only the rebellious and stiff neck, that's the key thing, is it's going to testify against. But if you do righteously, it will testify on your behalf. See, that it doesn't say condemnation. That word is nowhere in Deuteronomy chapter. And sister brought us there. It was nowhere there. It just says a witness. And if anybody's ever seen a court proceedings, you know, witnesses can go on either side. But I guess when it comes to this, people are narrow minded and linear and they don't understand the width and breadth of what's being expressed. So I'm going to shut up. I see Andrew join. Thank you, my brother, for joining um, a car. Um, and brother Concrete, <laughs> um, I'll let you go, Andrew. Go, ahead, Andrew. You got the floor. No, I was just gonna say shalom, Israel. Yabba shalom, shalom. Shalom. Thank you for allowing me on the stage. That's what I was gonna say, and I'll wait for other brothers to speak first. Nah, brother. You know, shalom, brother Divine. When you speak and the truth speaking, I don't have to talk. I like to get fed, man. So thank you for allowing me on the stage, brother. Anytime, King. Anytime, and you know, 
<laughs> you said, bro, have him bring me back on the stage. I was like, yeah, because what you said was paramount, but I think I think it goes over their head. And I think that happens to all of us, right? When people say things, sometimes it goes over our head and sometimes we go back and contemplate and say, man, you know what? That brother, sister's right. But we have a lot of pride and we never want to come back and say, you know what? You were right. What I do, I just hit them in the private. Hey, yo, you were right. <laughs> so I have to say it openly. I'm just sure. joking. Uh, sure. I love, um, I love but, to hear but, you speak, man. I, I believe you have an anointing on your life as well. And I just, I don't have to talk, man. Especially, only time I really talk when they're lying. And that's when I'm on their grass, bro. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I'm on their grass when they're lying. I appreciate that, King. And and ultimately, it's not even about me. What I do is I always give people sources outside of myself so they can fact check what I'm saying, right? So they don't have to take my word for it. They can do their own independent study because I don't believe in ambush scholarship. Every time I've had a debate, I've always given my opponent every all the resources that I use. I don't hide no hands. Why should I? If you stand on truth, then you should have fear of transparency. It's okay to be open and say, look, this is A, B, and C, what I use to get to this, this thesis and this, this end point. And what's funny, what Ghetto President does is that it's unfortunate, but every time he sees that I'm on stage, he says, oh, you a theologian. I'm not a theologian. Where's he getting that from? Because I have a degree. You know, I got my degree from a black college. And that's the only reason why I got that degree, because I was asked to be one of the first honorees of their PhD program or THD program. That's the only reason why I got it. I've been operating way before I even got a degree. But I was just it was just bestowed upon me and I accept it because it was an institution in my community that I wanted to support. And I said, sure, I'll go through the program. I'll do whatever's required because I want to show our people that we have our own institutions. It's called the Hebraic Institute of Theology, right? That's where I got my degree from, right? I went through their um, their master's program up into their, their uh, doctorate program. And the difference is with a THD and PhD, it's actually less amount of time and it's more of a research degree that I have. It's a general research degree. But my dissertation, which, which I think is very important, and if y'all are interested in it, just let me know. My dissertation is um, the importance of culture, cultural orientation, how that's necessary in order to properly exegete the Hebrew Bible. And what I was pretty much trying to appeal to was the notion that a lot of people misinterpret things, right, from other cultures simply because they don't live in a culture. Just because I learn Spanish does not mean I will easily connect with somebody if I go to Mexico. You know why? Because the way they use the language is based, is dictated by their culture. Absolutely. The way I'm using it is the way I was trained, I was taught, and from my worldview in a Western society. So just because I can speak their language doesn't mean I speak their language. Absolutely. Right? So, yeah. So, so what I was trying to convey is that in order for us to understand what's going on during that time, we need a cultural orientation. And I use the same example as when you first get a job. You know, the first thing your job does is that they give you an orientation. What is an orientation? To align you with the direction that they want you to go by following rules, guidelines, and protocols. So you are sensitive about company culture and you're able to achieve all the goals that is placed before you. You see? So, so you need orientation. So, so the problem is a lot of Christians don't have the proper cultural orientation. And because of such of the Semitic world, so I'm not just saying just Israelite or Hebrew, I'm talking about Aramaic, Arabic, every, they don't have an understanding because they're not part of that culture and because they don't think it's necessary. They think they're above learning the culture of a people you're putting your faith in. Well, Yeshua, Jesus, he was a Jew. In Nazareth, which is the hood, is a, the province was Galilee, Nazareth was a small town in Galilee. So it'll be equivalent to the places that certain groups of people, ethnic groups of people, and I don't want to, I don't want to make anybody feel uncomfortable and tell the truth, see prime real estate in the hood and gentrify it. Absolutely. Right? Nazareth, you're telling the truth. You're telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Nazareth 
was that type of town. Just like when people make fun of the prophet Muhammad because he was illiterate. Brother, oh, Jesus, we don't see him brother. writing anything. Well, anyway, I'm sorry. I know that was going to appeal to you, concrete yeah, boy. <laughs> but, but the point I'm trying to make... <laughs> The point I'm trying to make is that illiteracy does not denote unintelligible, right? It does not denote that. It doesn't mean that you have no intelligence because you're illiterate. Matter of fact, Eastern cultures are high context cultures. Western cultures are low context. What does that mean? That means a lot of times Western cultures are devoid of certain principles that you gain from culture because it's about the individual as opposed to the collective. So the collective in high complex in high complex cultures, they require on the social memory and the oral tradition and the grooming from the community before something is spoken. But when you focus on the individual, a lot of this came about when the Greeks took over and came into power. As a matter of fact, we transitioned into even the establishment of the Senate in Rome, right? Just like we borrow from today in American culture, it's about the individual. So the high context culture can convey messages in shorter sentences because there are other features of the culture that are being conveyed either through the verbiage, the body language, the tone. This is why when you look at Semitic languages, they are tonal and emphatic languages because those the emphasis on the tones that's used, even to the point where things are placed, what we call cantillation marks, meaning that how things are said is really sung. Right, because the conveyance of information when you're in that culture is very deep just with the little bit that is said because you're inside the culture so you can grasp that. So if I say to somebody, let heaven and earth be a witness against you and I ask a person who is outside the culture, what does that mean? They're gonna give me whatever presuppositions, whatever things they think it means. But if somebody's in that culture and I say it to them, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I ain't got to say no more. I ain't got to break it down. I ain't got to write a dissertation. I ain't got. They know. They get it. And that's what it is. So when Yeshua is speaking, it is already the consensus that he was primarily speaking Aramaic. This is the New Testament consensus of scholarship. He was speaking Aramaic. So if he's speaking Aramaic and that's how he conveys information day to day, not saying that he was ignorant of some Latin and Greek, they say he would have known some of that, but he primarily spoke to his people in Aramaic. That's why in the book of Matthew, we see tons of Aramaisms, the way it's structured, the way the syntax is set up, the way that he goes into what we call volatative sin, the way he goes into a justice or cohortive when he speaks, the way things are a range. We know that style. And we can say, wait, that's Aramaic. Like somebody translated, but but the essence is Aramaic. So I would have to be in that culture in order to understand these things when they're said to me, to be like, oh, so when he says heaven and earth, that's something that is already in the colloquial speech of the people at that time. So they can discern what he's talking about. Because the law is tied to heaven and earth because of Moses. He invoked it to be a witness for the law. And Yeshua is not coming to abolish it. He's coming to bring it to his fruition or maturity. That's, that's the key thing. The people were immature because their leaders at the time were creating this wall of partition. That's the, that's the word. Between them and the Most High. Mark chapter 7 breaks that down very succinctly so we can grasp what's being conveyed. And he says very clear, when they saw his disciples eating with unwashing hands and not doing so ceremoniously according to traditions of their ancestors, then they began to question Jesus and he discerned what was in his heart. And then he started, proceeded to speak to them. But one thing that he says to them is very clear. And I think that this is the part that becomes missed when we interpret what's called the New Testament. He says in verse six, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Verse eight, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. 
And then he gives an example of this that you can find in Mishnah. So Mishnah, and anybody can go and look this up. You can go to safaria.org, right? Mishnah Yadayim 111. And what it talks about is it tells you how to ritually wash one's hands, right? It says, the introduction goes, the first Mishnah of Yadayim is about how much water is necessary for the ritual washing of one hand. A log is about half a liter of water, so the basic amount of one quarter log works out to be about 100 grams of water, a third of a can of Coke for those who drink that stuff. We should note that the Mishnah expresses washing one's hands by referring to a servant doing the work. The servant literally gives water to the diner's hands. This is expressive of the setting of a formal banquet. In other words, the Hebrew phrase, netilat yadayim or natnim le yadim used in this Mishnah are translations of common Greek words. It shows how much influence eating customs had on the Jews of the period. Well, what is this talking about? Well, in 200 CE, that is when the Mishnah was codified, collated, and completed. And the purpose of the Mishnah was to preserve the oral tradition that was laid out by the Beit Din. Beit means house, Din means judgment. House of Judgment are also known as the Sahedrin Council. And what would happen is that people would come to them with various concerns, issues, problems, questions, or whatever. And then through the consensus of that, that Beit Deen, they would rule on certain things that would then become adopted into the cultural norm. Okay. One of those things is the washing of hands. Now, one thing that we see that's very interesting in the book of, Levit uh, of Leviticus, it explains that before the priest can perform work, they must wash their hands and wash their feet before they can begin their work in the temple. So what they did was they extracted that because they were ruling on something. Somebody came to them and said, you know, hey, you know, I went to go wash my hands, but, you know, I was probably unclean because of this or unclean because of that. How do I know that I'm clean and eating a meal? So they have to extrapolate something from written Torah. And they put it together with what's called minkhagin, which is the customs that the people had at that time, and fuse them together in a ruling in order to establish something that could become cultural mandate. It can't, it can't be no more than a cultural mandate because Torah is not explicitly speak on this. So they go and look at the part where it talks about washing and what the priest has to do to wash your hands so their hands are clean before they do the work. And then they look at things in their customs during the day and they say, hey, look, this is what you're supposed to do. Before you wash your hands, if somebody's in your house, you have a servant, let the servant do it. Let them put 100 grams on you. Wash your hand this way, turn your hand this way. And then you will know after doing this that you are clean to go eat a meal. So when Yeshua identified this, he said, wait a second. Whoa, what, what's this? Are y'all saying? that this is going beyond or above the commandments of God. You guys are creating this gap between the people and the creator by becoming their intermediary. That's not your role to do that. Matter of fact, the Pharisees as a sect don't go back no further than the third century BCE. They didn't exist in history prior to that. The Sadducees didn't exist in history prior to that. The Essenes didn't exist prior to that. The Zealots didn't exist prior to that. So historically, you have to understand how this group came about and who does it consist of. You know why? Because Paul was a Benjamite and also a Pharisee. How about that? That's interesting. Because only the Levites could be priests, but yet Paul was a Pharisee in the tribe of Benjamin? Fascinating stuff. Fascinating. But nevertheless, let me let me not keep speaking. If anybody else wants to add in or contribute, feel free to do so. That was a great dissertation, and I appreciate that. No problem, my brother. Um, if not, I guess I could keep going and just wrap it up because I know it's kind of it's late or early for some of y'all. Uh, but ultimately, just to reset things, um, we were initially trying to um bring uh, Brother Ghetto president in here because he had made a claim that we wanted to give him the benefit of doubt on and allow him to explain himself. 
in regards to saying that Paul's words supersede the Gospels and that Paul's words supersedes the words of Christ. And he was trying to come on the lines in which that he was given the authority by Christ to speak on his behalf. And therefore, that's how it supersedes his words. I simply countered that by saying, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1? Because if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, there's no way around that. It's very clear. He says, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. The one who is imitating, yeah, the one who is imitating can never be greater than the one who he's imitating. How can the imitator be greater than the one he's imitating? How? If he's imitating him, there's no way you can get around that. Go ahead, King. So lucky, you know, I said it in the other room and I'll say it again, right? This is why Israelites, as annoying as we are, will keep bringing up 2 Peter 3, verse 16 and 17. He's literally leading himself into crazy destruction. Like when it's all said and done, Paul kept the law. Paul taught to keep the law. Just You just need to know how to, why is it that a lot of Christians will use a scripture and it's good... It, Shalom priest, this is something I actually got from priests actually, I've heard him say it often and it's so true, where Christians will use a verse to disqualify another verse rather than see how to harmonize them. I brought him to John 7 verse 16, where out of Christ's own mouth, he says, look, this doctrine is not mine, but by the one who sent me. Brought him to Proverbs 4 verse 2 to show him what the doctrine is, the law. Tyree sliced up that Basui brother, um, showing that Abraham actually kept the law as per Genesis 26, verse 5. Mm-hmm. And this, as much as she was a Christian, what she said was so true, Sister Kale, where it's so funny, the pride that we see in Christianity, when you're not actually willing to genuinely submit to what the word of God actually says. And then he spoke on behalf of all Christians. And what bugged me is that none of the Christians spoke up. There was a lot more skilled Christians on the stage that I've heard dialogue before. And not one of them spoke up. None of them said anything. And I thought, wow, this is Christianity. You let him speak on your behalf. And then Legrand actually tried to water it down. I don't think he meant that. No, he didn't say that. And then shut down the room. This is where they don't want to biblically hold themselves accountable to the scriptures. But we, Israelites, are the annoying ones. We are the ones that actually hold people accountable to the scriptures. So he, for someone, for someone to totally ignore Matthew four and four, man shall live, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Paul. It doesn't. <laughs> it, that that's what I heard from Ghetto Present. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Paul is what we should live by. And then the idiot said, "Oh, it, the new covenant is open to everyone." Then you show him Jeremiah thirty-one, thirty-one, Hebrews eight and eight. They don't address it. I don't, I, I just. I just wish a Christian actually spoke up at that time and really to be a steward of the scriptures. Um, but I appreciate, oh, I think she's on the stage. I appreciate what Sister Kale actually said. But yeah, Shalom, yes. are you? Yeah, Shalom, yeah, King. You know, one, oh, hold, hold on, Sister Kale. I'm going to give you the floor. One second, sis. I just want to uh, shout out um, um, Priest Daniel Allen in the building. Thank you for coming to the stage. So um, let me let Sister Kale speak, Sister. And this sister had no dog in the fight, by the way, just so you all know. She had no dog in the fight. And she spoke a truth. Well, she came in there bussing, like, okay. she divine? She came in there bussing, bro. Man, she was Hokma in the flesh. She was wisdom in the flesh. So, guys, she got the floor. What I was going to say is that, obviously, there's different... I think in relation to that guy, I don't know what it's called. But, you know, he doesn't speak for Christians or whatever. He speaks for himself. So, the way that I've been brought up, sometimes there's no point arguing with somebody that... They're not teachable. Then they're, they're not at the place where they want to receive anything. Now, just to give it the easiest context in what I identify myself with now, even though I don't fully agree with the particular religion, but in terms of their doctrines, I'm Seventh Day. So, not all Christians are completely uh, uh, averse to the Bible because obviously the the general Sunday church is obviously the apostate church. They they don't know that, and so I think sometimes even you obviously are speaking truth and stuff like that but i think they might need milk and you're trying to give them yam and dashi it's not it can't they can't receive it because they're not used to referring to the word 
in in their debate and they have no understanding of their own identity or historic or history or anything like that so i just wanted to say i think some i don't know if there were other christians that were on the platform but when you know somebody speaking fully what 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 can you say because it is a condition there's no point speaking with somebody that is clearly he knows he's wrong and yet he's still prepared to put out an argument and then the concern that i had as well is that they use their error and say it's the Holy Spirit. That is a concern. So if somebody's arguing like that, I don't know where you're supposed to go from there. Yeah, and I agree. You know, it is the it's, it's a shock factor. You know, it is. It's the shock factor after he got destroyed a couple of nights ago by Malhalab. So he thought, you know what? I got obliterated. I'm just going to just F up Clubhouse. I'm just going to mess it up in just one hit. I'm going to say the wildest shit because of what happened a couple of nights ago and everyone was there to see. That's that's what I think it is. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if I could, uh, yes, he's, uh, if he said that I wasn't there, I left. I, I, I said Shalom as soon as he started putting people down for wanting to dialogue with him. He would ask him for dialogue with him to tell you to me. That's weird to me. Sounds like I'm out of here. But if he did say that, the, the sad thing is man, that that's blasphemy. I mean, it, you know what I mean? It, it, I pray the brother repent. I haven't heard nobody say that, but I, I, I do pray the brother repent and come back to the Lord. But it sounds like you're getting ready to fall out of everything. If you're not even about to be a Christian, you know what I'm saying? That's what it sounds like you got to happen. So. I pray for that brother, man. I hope he's going to be all right. I hope he's going back to the Lord. But Never fashion. I said this earlier, though, you know, and I like to say really clear things and say my position. I I really feel like Ghetto was honest. Um, You know, I feel like he's completely wrong, uh, but I feel like that was the first step in coming closer to biblical truth. Because he said that Paul's letters supersede Christ's words. And that's how most traditional Christians feel. Now, they will never say it because, of course, they will put Christ above Paul. So they will never say it, you know, so they can sleep well at night. But when they're teaching and instructing out of the text, mostly they're going to go to Galatians and Ephesians. They're not going to go to Matthew 5, Matthew 23, anything that Christ actually said about the law. They're not going to go there. If that's the discussion, they're not going to go there. If, if, the, if the discussion is salvation, they're not going to go to Matthew 10 and Matthew 15. They're not going to touch on those things that Christ said about it. They're going to go to what Paul said. Their whole entire doctrine comes from the foundation of Paul. So this is something that we are very well, we understand, and we try to let them know what they are doing. We try to let them know, hey, we're tired of calling you guys Christians. Then we, you know, I start calling them members of Christianity. Hey, I'm tired of calling you guys members of Christianity. I start calling you guys Paulinians. But then that's not even fair because it's like you're not even following Paul because follow Paul, follow Christ. So that's not even truly fair so i started dumbing it okay well i just feel like you're bible like an atheist because you enjoy reading the text but you're not actually doing anything that the text say or that christ is actually telling that you should employ in your lives as well as your family so i'm trying to pinpoint what it is and communicate with them so they can realize what's going on and i think that statement is a big turn to Christianity. Because if you say, if a so-called Christian say that Paul's letters supersede Christ's words, that is a good starting point for us to communicate better with each other because that's what we have been trying to demonstrate to you that that's what you believe. So he doubled down on it. I mean, he said it in clear words. It's a crazy statement, yes, but it's it's a crazier lifestyle or crazier uh, instructing style if you're doing it worse than just saying it. So he said it and he does it. So, I mean, it's not 
that deep if he said it and do it. So now we need to communicate for the next step is say, well, should Paul's letters supersede Christ's words? That's the next step. Because, I mean, that's what we should start communicating with him or others who actually teach with his teaching style. So I actually commend it in a way because that's literally what we try to communicate to them anyway. Yeah. So and the so, thing so, of, okay. Okay. I was going to say Sunday worshippers do not love the but they're not that's not how they've been socialized they're not into the bible that's not their thing they're into what they're into which involves emotionalism and sensationalism that's that's not what they do so if they don't do that you, the more that you push the bible at them it's a rebuke it, it antagonizes them it, that's not what they're used to they're into somebody coming and hollering and whatever and telling them something that resonates with their wicked spirit which is us on a whole. But I think on the other side, we have to be careful that while we may be lovers of the word, that we don't end up like the Pharisees and the scribes where you can love the word, but deny the power of, of what it is supposed to do, which is transform us and make us demonstrate the fruits of the spirit. So I'm saying that it's difficult. You, you, I'm not saying that you're overestimating them, but there is not that level of information that is being filtered. That's why they, it, for them, it's like you're giving them poison because this goes against everything they've ever been taught, which is not much. That is very, and I, and I, very true. Yeah, and I'll say yep. that, and, and for the record, you know, we're not demeaning, demoting, or disparaging Paul at all. Like, that is not our position, right? We are simply saying that he does not have the preeminence, right? He is a hierarchical structure, and he is not at the top. He is merely a vessel for information to proceed from, right? So if he says clearly, imitate me as I imitate Christ, and that worm, uh, excuse me, worm, <laughs> that word, uh, me, my tice, in the Greek comes where we get our English word mimic from, right? And typically when you see that word used in classical Greek, it's always speaking of a lesser imitating his mentor. And he is never above the mentor. He is always subject to the mentor, right? So even in that word itself, when we look at it, he clearly is using his words carefully because he knows that people can only imitate him as he's imitating Christ. So if I see something that he does, and I'm like, wait, wait, dude, Christ didn't do that. <laughs> well, hold on, he didn't say that. Oh, wait, 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 you don't mean, so then guess what, right? I only imitate Paul as he's imitating Christ. That's how that works. So if I see anything outside of that, then guess what? It doesn't have any preeminence. And that's very clear by how it's conveyed. So ultimately we're just saying anything that Paul does has to be tested with the word. This is why the Berean church was commended because they didn't take anything this dude was saying at face value. They went and they researched it. So hold on, hold on, wait, 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 what? They got to fact check this dude. That's the way it works. So we have the same burden today that if we see anything written by anybody outside of Yeshua or what the father laid out in Tanakh, we have to measure it against that. And if it does not even out on the scale, guess what? We're dealing with unjust scales and we have to just toss the whole thing out. So that's the important thing. And like you said, sis, the key thing is transformation. See, what I try to demonstrate, and I'm not perfect in any way, shape, or form, and again, that's very interesting that we're perfect, but in any way, shape, or form, however, even in the midst of my imperfection, right, fruits still have to grow. So I may not be the most straightest tree, right? I may be a tree, I may be a little link this way, or a little link that way, meaning some help, but guess what? I'm bearing fruit, right? And the key thing is, when I was speaking with them, I never raised my voice, didn't curse, didn't yell, didn't scream. I interjected a few times respectfully, but the key thing is even in taking my time and trying to walk them through it, I was seen as a knock. And it was like, nope, we're not gonna give him no time to speak. We're not gonna let him let off. And it's unfortunate because the key thing is they really don't wanna exegete the text. Like you said, sis, there, it's all based on sens sensationalism. And I think things are said to get people's attention because they feel their voice is not being heard. So you don't have to raise your voice you don't have to do what he did. Like when we started the second room, everybody was cordial. We were laughing and joking with Elder LeGrant talking about, you know, social security. And, and here he come. It's, it seems like 
for some reason, he just kept talking when the last room ended and did not finish talking. It just talked in the room and just kept talking. It's like, brother, where is your decorum, right? Where is your acknowledgement that other human beings are around you? Where is your relational skills, right? Like, like, dude, can you come off your high horse for a moment just to say, hey, peace, how y'all doing? And what's going on? And can, can you have a moment of doing that? And when I saw that, and again, I saw a little Grant do it. But when I saw that he didn't even want to say hi to people, that disturbed me. And I said to myself, is he is he pastor in somebody's church? I mean, he calls himself ghetto president. You know, he always makes this grandiose claim of what he comes to do all the time, like a cult leader. It's very, very, very scary. And he does this thing without acknowledgement of other people like. Let somebody else give you your flowers, my brother. You don't have to big yourself up. That's that ego and pride that is causing you to be distanced from people who simply want to learn. But the way you are shoving things down their throat and then challenging people, <laughs> challenging people like, like you have all the truth, that's unfortunate because that's to your own downfall. And ultimately, at the end of the day, people are more in tune to a still voice with truth that a loud voice with lies and opinion, you know, and the more that we understand that if we stand on the truth, you don't have to do this great showmanship, that right, effort to do all of this stuff for what? Just stand on it and speak straightly, stand up like a man, right? And speak straightly. That's it. So I just, I'm, I'm, up, I'm, up, and I'm about to close the room, but I just want to thank everybody for joining in. The replays is on. You can go back and check it out. This is our commentary on the previous loom that was set up by Elder LeGrant. Um, it's funny because when Concrete came in, I don't even think I see your brother on here no more. But when he came in, <laughs> a little Grant finally said, hey, let me go get my Bible now because y'all going to make me get into my Bible. And we was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the goal. The goal was, wasn't you, I, I'm saying myself, wasn't you reading that the whole time? Like, and, and that's, that is the part that also disturbed me. Are you having a biblical discussion without even having your Bible open? My God, like I said, I hope they're not pastoring nobody's church. Hey, divine. If they are, something is clearly disturbing about that. Go ahead, King. I think it's Corey that is, um, I think Corey coined it quite well, um, what, I think a couple of weeks ago in the God First Gang. Shalom on Corey. Um, he coined it quite well on the basis of a lot of these Christians, like even when I was in the um, Christian churches and when I was in ministry. And sorry, side note, Sister Kale. Uh, bless you, sis. I know you're from New Testament. I used to preach it quite often, especially in the Lee branch and also the one in Wilsden. It's a small world. Um, but yeah, um, when I was in the Christian churches, right, I've never ever in all my years of ministry heard them speak about the details of Esau or speak about biblical prophecy. I never heard of that. And I say this all the time. I've, other than Matthew 24, I have never ever heard them. So it's nice to know that Israelites are actually now challenging them to actually open their Bible now or challenging them to actually go into it and study it for real now. But I think it's getting to the stage now where a lot of people think that they can confound Israelites by bringing out the Galatians 5s and the Colossians 2 and the Ephesians 3 and stuff. We've heard it so often. It's helped us to exercise how to even show you that your understanding of it is silly. But it goes back to what Sister Kale was saying. It's that pride of not willing to submit to the scriptures. So even as a minister, when I came, when I heard this stuff and, and came to the truth, as much as I tried to refute, I, 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 I struggled. And I realized, you know what? We've got it wrong all this time. Try to convey it to leadership and bishops and pastors. And that's just one thing, man, just humility. So as much as we can almost come across as attack bulldogs and stuff, in this day and age before Yahweh Shai returns, we're trying to be the best stewards and defenders and warriors for the scriptures. So when our own people lie on the scriptures, we will stand up for it by any means necessary. And that's the standpoint for any Israelite. Some may go overboard, and I understand. Sometimes do too much or do too little. But essentially, when have you ever seen black people fight so hard for unity um, as the Bible as their moral compass? And I'll say in closing, um, Isaiah 58 and verse one, right? It says, cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgressions to the house of Jacob, their sins. It's unapologetic when the text tells us 
what to do. This is a jessif in the Hebrew. It's a command that's being given that we are to do. And also like we see in Ezekiel about the watchman that sees the sword. When we see these things, we speak out on it. And sometimes I got to get the greater tip all the time. If I'm a lifeguard and I have a post on the beach and somebody has gone out too deep and they are panicking and they are about to drown, right? I go out there in the water, I risk my life, right? People say, well, this guy's crazy. There's the sharks in that water. He's going to save that person. He might as well. I'm coming out there to rescue that person. And the process of doing so, because they're in a state of panic, they're elbowing me, kicking me, pushing me away, and I'm trying to save them, right? But it's not until I'm able to get them out of that deep and onto dry ground, right, and administer any kind of aid that they may need for relief, that it's going to take some time for it to set in that you was actually out there and somebody took up the charge to go out there and save you when everybody else stood on the beach shore. And that is what we are attempting to do. We are attempting to get our people's attention because they have forsaken the word of Yah. They think they know it because they think going to church and you have a good pastor that preaches and my pastor got a degree, that that automatically exonerates you from getting into the text. And in closing, I'll say, even though people may have a distaste for the Israelite group, and I agree with Andrew, some of us do go overboard, right? Some of us are pretty extreme, and I understand, but that's not all of us, right? Um, however, there are Christian groups that are extreme. Westboro Baptist Church is one great example of that. But anyway, I could name at least 212 Christian churches that y'all probably never even heard of that talk worse than Israelites. But you see, I try not to bring those things up, right? I try to be honest and give people their stage and their opportunity to speak for themselves. But the thing that I'm saying is all those unpaid receipts of the Christian church, it's because the modern day 2022 Israelite movement that is forcing them to go back and say, wow, I really don't know that Bible. Man, pastor was teaching me all this time. And all I remember was the title of his message. Don't know any of the scriptures he gave me. Now they got to go back. And they got to take care of those unpaid receipts. And this is one of the things that's said by a lot of Christian apologists, that the pastors are the blame because they did not disciple their parishioners. And because of such, now we have this movement that's simply out here to attack Israelites, right? Like, of course, you got you to gotta expect them to respond. But when you look at Pew stats, and this is a, a uh, they do studies in regards to church and stuff like that. The decline from church membership is the highest that has ever been in the entire state of the church here in America. The highest. People are leaving in droves. So now damage control has to take place. And just to give you guys a heads up on this, right? There's actually a documentary coming out from the Jude 3 project called Unspoken. And right now they're on um, Indigo. Uh, Indiegogo.com trying to raise funds to put forth this documentary. Right now, they got $53,000. So they actually met their goal of $50,000, right? But the purpose of this is to address all the questions that is being asked the church that the church in times past had overlooked. They have not equipped their parishioners on how to address these cold, hard questions that's coming to them. But now they see in the past, you can dismiss it, you can ignore it, but with the the the, the uh, explosion of the internet and social media and how fast information travels, it is impossible to blockade all of your members of your church from information that's going out. So now you're forced to teach them the Bible. You're forced to disciple them. You're forced to explain what proper exegesis is in the history of Israel. And now supersessionism or what they call replacement theology can no longer sit. You can no longer be ignorant of the Tanakh or the Old Testament. You can no longer be ignorant of the intertestamental period, which is the whole history that happens before the New Testament even opens up. Now right. you got to learn about where Jesus comes from, the language of Aramaic, how people convey things to themselves, what the idea of salvation was to those people, not what your church teaches you. But what did those people understand that to be? See, these are the things that now they have to do. So what they do is 
oh man, we gotta make these documentaries. So now they create a documentary where at the end of their documentary, they show an Israelite group. It happens to be Sakari, by the way. They show an Israelite group because what they're trying to show you is they're the reason why we have to make this documentary. <laughs> Yo, when I say that this is very unnerving, right? That they feel like, man, we gotta do something. They have to come together and say, wow, what are we gonna do about losing all of these, these, these members who were just sitting in the pew all these years and now they're coming back and they're asking other church members, hey, did you know about this? Did you know about that? What are we gonna do about it? So this is now what we're witnessing today. And this is why I say to Christians, even if you don't agree with Israelites, that's fine. Israelites don't agree with Christians. But like Sister Kale says, there's some things we can learn from each other. I don't know if it's a lot, but there's things we can learn from each other. But nonetheless, the most key thing is, once I encounter you, what does it equip me to do afterwards? Am I gonna continue to go back to my old ways? Or am I gonna say, well, man, I gotta step this up. I, I gotta do something about it because now they gotta ask the questions like, is Christianity a white man's religion? And you know, where did the, the history of the black church come from? And all this other stuff. And it's very funny what they try to do with you. And again, I wanna close out, but I think this is important is they try to make Christianity connect to Africa, right? But watch this, right? The Christianity that you see in Africa that was like, in, that indigenously made its way to Africa, one of the most unconquered nations in Africa was Ethiopia, right? But, but when you see how Christianity enters Africa, the version of Christianity they have is not the same thing that Orthodox Christians in the Western world believe. But they wanna say, oh, look, look at Tertullian. Tertullian was an African. Look at after nature, they're Africans. <laughs> They'll say that to you, and then you go back and look at the sketches of how these people were drawn. But anyway, so so nonetheless, they try to do that because they realize if we don't show the people that Christianity is African, nobody's gonna believe it. Like they have to actually reach and do that to it's show hard. that it is African. It's that, hard. That, uh, we've been um we've been trying to tell them for years about the people that came to the Council of Nicaea. They didn't want to hear it, but now they're talking about it. The people that came from Council of Nicaea did not come from Europe. They came from the South. There just, you go. Yes. There you go. And there's no way around that. So when you hear people talking about Calvinism, Calvinism is not an African version of Christianity. Where do you get that at? If you go to anybody, like if you go to the to Taiwido uh, Orthodox Ethiopian Church and you ask them, hey, if I, t if I came to you with this type of Christianity, what would you think about it? They'll say, we don't know what that is. If you go to the Coptic church and say that they were like, what is that? They don't, they, they don't, that's not the form of Christianity they have. So if you're gonna be honest about it, how about you teach the version of Christianity that they have? Matter of fact, if you're really gonna make this appeal to black people, then you should be teaching the works of James H. Cone, which he wrote a book called Black Theology and Black Power, where he realized that the version of Christianity that black people had in America was not sufficient because it did not teach the very principles of who the gospel was supposed to go to and who was primarily for, the poor, the destitute, the ones who are cast out by society. That was us. So if you're really gonna do something and acknowledge that this book is for our liberation, but only if it's in the right hands to teach it, then how about you go with a James H. Cone? And this is the one, by the way, Jeremiah Wright, right? the one who was the pastor of Barack Obama, this is the doctrine he was teaching from. He was teaching from the doctrine that was taught by James H. Cohn in his book, Black Theology and Black Power. So at the end of the day, if at the very least, what these conversations do for the audience, maybe not the people on the stage, is as they're listening, the objective is, let me go back and research that for myself. Because the one thing that I major in is equipping other people to fact check me, to hold me accountable. And I would say eight times out of 10, they're like, you know what, Divine, you were spot on. I can't even argue with that. But the two times out of 10, when they come and they tell me something or correct me, I receive it because the only L I take is to learn. I'm open for that. I'll take those L's any day because that's the only way that we can remain humble enough to grow, right, and to advance. And I had to learn that process transition from Christianity to here. Because when I was in Christianity, I had a very pompous spirit as a Christian. Like that's the essence. Like that's what I, that's what is like placed on you 
when you're talking to other people, like you, you just dismiss what they're saying. You don't want to hear it. Say that they're wrong. And the most name calling came from the Christians in that room. Name calling. It was astonishing to me. I'm like, why are they just calling people names? Like, what's that about? That's supposed to be operating in love. You know, this, this love law that you talk about all the time. Y'all not operating in it. People hit me up and say, Divine, man, I don't feel love coming from these Christians. Why are you having a conversation with them? I said, hey, you know, it's only through the abundance when the mouth speaks that the heart is revealed. So just let them speak long enough and we'll see where their heart is at. And like we did and we saw earlier when we witnessed ghetto president that he spoke long enough and now we see where the brother's heart is. And with that, thank you all for being on the panel. I appreciate it. Everybody who's in the audience, please follow all the brothers and the sister that's on the panel with me. These are all great people that I can vouch for. I've listened to them in other rooms. Some of them, I know them personally, et cetera. Um, and also, you can subscribe and follow me. I also have a, a house called KHM Research Discussions. So you can find that on my profile. And if you want to support anything that I say or I do, the best way to do it is on my Patreon, which you can find on my profile, because I put a whole, I have almost 700 pieces of research on there, books, articles, uh, blogs that I write on various things. Uh, I give you access to paid Bible software, to audio Bibles that's, that's performed by people of color. Like I give you tons of resources on there. So that anything that I say or I reference will be there and I keep it in one repository so that anybody can go there and extract from all the aggregation of information that I bring to the community and I want to make common. Because the one thing that they'll say or they try to say about Israelites or that we're ignorant and we're, we're high school dropouts and you know we're ex-convicts, they'll say those things as if those people, something is wrong with those people. I mean, I'm sure a lot of them also had that type of past. Matter of fact, who did Jesus go to? So when, people, when I hear people say stupid, ignorant stuff like that, I'm like, man, you don't even know Jesus. He went with the wine bibbers, the prostitutes, the poor. He was touching lepers. Lepers were the most unclean thing in all of Israel. And that's who he went to. That's who came to him. The woman who had the issue of blood, she came to him. Mary Magdalene, the one that had all these spirits and some of all these men, she came to an apostle and said, whoa, hold on. Do you know who this is? These are the people he came to. So if our message has to go to those people and you want to keep your message to self-righteous self people, go ahead and do that. But we know who this gospel is for. And this is who we preach it to, our people, because it's in their DNA. They may not know that. And I've had plenty of conversations to prove that we are those people of the book. And with that, thank you all for listening. Um, again, I look forward to joining your stages soon. You can come to my stage soon. And um, we'll speak again, family. Get some rest. Um, those of you who are in London, I, I got to tip my hat off to you because y'all got a head start on me. I'm going to try to get some sleep. Um, but I'll what's see you. What's the time over there, Divine? What's the, what's, the divine? what's the time over there? It's 5, 6, 5 46 a.m. Good grief. Good grief. What time is it where you are? It is quarter to 11. Quarter to 11 a.m. Okay. No problem. And if anybody has any questions, anything like that, feel free to inbox me or back channel me. That's what they say. And I'll, and I'll address it. But any resources that I have, I'll make it available to y'all. Just let me know which one it is and I'll give it to y'all. So get some rest, y'all. Thank you for joining this panel as well as in the audience. I hope y'all were edified. I'm going to keep y'all my prayers. And until we meet again, peace and shalom.